So first, I would like to turn to you, Catherine. Um, you are one of the co-authors of the Global Sustainable Development Report from last year. So in this report, you outline six entry points and four levers to help implement the SDGs. So how do you think these entry points and, lead, uh, and levers can help Nordic societies to speed up the implementation of the SDGs? Thank you, Martin. I actually hope very, very much that this will, this will stop, um, uh, will help us to move from thinking about the individual SDGs. Because if you think about it, there's nothing special about any of the SDGs. We knew in 2012 that we had challenges in all of those boxes. And indeed, we actually had UN agreements for most of them on women, on peace, on water, on climate, on biodiversity, and so on. So what's interesting about the SDGs is the fact that they're brought into a single framework. And that means that it's the interactions between them that are in focus and not the individual SDGs themselves. And in reality, where sustainability happens is in the interface between the goals that make life better for people, that is to say one, two, three, four, five, six, which is um, poverty, hunger, um, health, uh, education, um, ge gender equality, and access to water and, and, uh, and, and sanitation, and our use of the global resources, which can be boiled down to climate and biodiversity. And it's this, it's this tension between the fact that you buy improvement of one, two, three, four, five, six by selling off 14, 13, 14, and 15, which is where we really need to concentrate all of our efforts. And all of the other SDGs can actually be assigned to different tools that we can use to relieve the pressure between the two endpoints here, the two groups of goals. And so by identifying six areas, that need transformation and those areas are about people, they're about um, the economic, economy and finance system, they're about the governance system, they're about um, uh, food system, um, energy system, uh, cities and peri-urban areas and our, our access to the global, global resources. If we look at those, how do we use the different SDGs to achieve relevant goals there? Um, make a transformation. I mean, you, the goals themselves aren't interesting. It's the transformation of these different areas that are interesting. And I think we have to change our thinking entirely around the SDGs. It's not about having a meeting focusing on SDG 14 or whatever. It's about understanding the interactions between them and reducing the negative interactions in them. And in the Nordic countries or the Northern Europe countries, I mean, we go around and we say we're number one or number two. Sweden and Denmark compete about being number one or two to do the SDGs, when in fact, we're no closer to achieving the SDGs than any developing country. But our challenges aren't on one, two, three, four, five, six. They're on 12, 13, 14, 15. Um, in addition to, yeah this Global Sustainable Development Report. We also have a paper by, by Jeffrey Sachs et al from last year, the six transformations to achieve the sustainable development goals. Uh, and this paper sort of outlines a similar approach in a way, but with transformations instead of entry points. Um, and although there are some differences between these two reports, they have many similarities and essentially try to focus on how to achieve yesterdays by reduce, sort of reducing the actions into specific areas. So, John, um, I would like to ask you, um, the subtitle of, of the Sustainable Development Report is The Future is Now, Science for Achieving a Sustainable de uh, Development. So how can science in general and SDS in Northern Europe in particular help to speed up the implementation of the SDGs in the Nordic countries? Challenging questions, Martin. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to say reports are quite important. Uh, they are definitely a step forward, trying to really define the at least entry points, but uh, in 
Jeffrey's uh, papers together with colleagues, the actual transformations that we need to go through to, to reach the, the global goals for sustainable development. But having said that, uh, they are quite widely defined, the, these areas. And if we focus in on the Nordic conditions, it's definitely the case that it's reports have, they are described uh, to fit the global needs, I would say. And we have a need to really specify better what, what the conditions are and what we need to do in the Nordic countries in relation to these transformations. The emphasis on, on the different entry points need to be really addressed. And so I, I think we have a lot of work to do to, to better define the transformation that we need to go through to actually achieve a sustainable development with the, the goals at 2030 to begin with. Um, so I, I could see that we in, in, in our, with our members, I, I could see a specific things we could actually do. We could really go through and sort of take the next step from these reports and papers and try to define much better what are the conditions in the Nordic countries with respect to these different aspects. So I, I could, I, I haven't talked to you about this, but I, I, I could see that we could form interest groups, theme groups across our national borders that are addressing different aspects of, of these questions about transformations. Hopefully that could lead to reviews, development and potentially joint research programs in the future. I would really like to see if that could be done. Otherwise, I would say the, the this question, as I understand it, relates to how we are dealing with the research science at universities and research institutes. And I think that a couple of things we need to think about is that we, we should definitely continue as we do to a great extent, but at the same time, we need to be relevant in, on, on the right time scales. So we may need to, to increase the, the uh, activities where we define the research question together with uh, the surrounding society, businesses, etc. So we have these different methods, co-production, co-creation uh, methods that we really define the questions together from the beginning instead of the scientists starting and then after X number of years uh, come up with a con conclusion that may perhaps be valuable, we should be in contact from, from the beginning and through the processes. I think that this is something we need to do more. And it also relates to research policy interactions that, that need to be more efficient. And in general, we need to transfer knowledge much faster and as sort of final word on this question, we need to break down a few barriers and, and be better at partnership and working together across different borders. One of the aims of the SDS networks worldwide is to support the implementation of the SDGs, of course, in particular through solution initiatives and long-term pathways, as we said. Um, uh, and these long-term pathways demand a well-functioning interface between science and policy, just as you mentioned here, Jan. So I would like to ask Kaisa, um, Kaisa from the Helsinki Institute of Sustainability Science, and of course you are allowed to also introduce yourself if you want to. Um, but Kaisa, you have experience in the science policy interface, uh, quite substantial experience. So how do you think the SDS and Northern Europe members can contribute even more to the science policy interactions? Okay, thank you, Martin. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to, to have a few words here. Uh, I'm Kaisa Korolev-Kurki from uh, University of Helsinki, Helsinki Institute of Sustainability Science, actually the first sustainability science center in, in our country. Uh, and um, I also work as a program director for uh, three huge research uh, programs on sustainable development uh, funded by the Finnish Academy Strategic Research Council and all those, the, the kind of new uh, focus and the aim in those uh, research uh, projects is to, to produce knowledge which is societally relevant and which uh, kind of test the, uh, 
they test the new methods of co-creation and uh, uh, co-production knowledge has been really really interesting uh past two years but uh if we uh, go to the question that you you were asking uh from me of course there are very many and different ways and models to work uh, in, in the science policy interface you can find a kind of platform models you can get researchers can get assignments directly from the government for example to produce different kind of reports there are nested activities like uh, for example in in our institute this kind of science policy uh, activities are inbuilt in in our uh, our work there are science panels maybe the ipcc is one of the the most known and there are national ones like we in finland have a climate panel which is very uh have a very uh, good position in in science advice in that sense that it's written it has a position it's written in the law uh that it uh, it needs to be heard in uh, when the climate decisions are made and the different dialogue models and so on and i think it it uh, very much depends on the the context it depends on the issue what works best in in which situation of course uh, for example uh uh, our uh, researchers and uh, also when the researchers get the funding to do research, uh, policy briefs, for example, are required more and more to be one of the outputs of the research. Not only the scientific articles, but that you need to produce some policy briefs. And uh, uh, it's, but it's not enough that you produce a policy brief. It's also very important to take care of, that you organize the event where you discuss those findings uh, with with those whom the the policy brief is targeted that we have uh, noticed in our activities that it's really important to to aim to build very confidential connections and relationships between researchers and decision makers in in in, in all of the levels of decision making uh, uh, for example we have very uh, fruitful ongoing collaboration with our institute and the finnish prime minister's uh, office where the national sustainable development coordination is is carried out and it has resulted started with a very uh, small activities but it has resulted with many many interesting uh, initiatives and consultations and I think that the, the SDS and members uh, in in all the nordic countries can contribute uh, in many ways in in various levels uh, in science policy in interactions it's not only the national level that you easily think that the, you need to, to work with the with the mem, um, uh, parliament or the ministries but uh, also many local universities can very effectively work with the provincial or municipality level uh, decision makers and i think my experience is that the researchers just uh, should be active that it's usually the the uh people in ministries or people in the municipalities are really pleased if you are if they are contacted by researchers who would like to collaborate with them and uh, uh, provide and also go create a new knowledge with, with them thank you kesa I, I i fully agree and i think that in, i mean in finland you have uh, you have as i understand it at least quite good interactions between science and policy at least mm. it's, I've been visiting some of the events that you talked about, for example, and and also the fact that the government is actually the prime minister is actually responsible for for sustainability in, in your country in a way. So maybe you have maybe you have easier an easier situation than the other Nordic countries to some extent. But but I think it's interesting that you bring up the these different levels, and we also have the level of the Nordic Council of Ministers. I mean the Nordic the Nordic level here that we could also think about. Universities, of course, also have the important task of providing high quality education, including education in sustainable development. And I think this is a very important task for SDS in Northern Europe. Uh, it is to stimulate the development where all our university students in our countries graduate with a good knowledge in sustainable development. So, Annick, you are the vice rector of NTNU in Ålesund. Um, and uh, in your opinion, um, how should um, universities organize their education in sustainable development to ensure that, that our students graduate with good knowledge in this area? Should it, for example, be in the form of a mandatory course 
in sustainable development or should we rather try to integrate uh, sustainable development throughout all programs and in, into courses in, in a more integrated way what is what is your view on this Annick? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. And um, I also want to introduce myself very briefly. <clears throat> I'm a professor in sustainability. We focus on environmental management and life cycle assessment. And uh, Antenu has an overall program on uh, sustainability. And uh, until 2017, I was the director of this program before I became the vice rector at the uh, campus we have in Ålesund. Ålesund is in the coast of, west coast of Norway. And um, um, since then, uh, the LTMU merged with the university uh, colleges in 2017. And LTMU in Ålesund is now what we say the most industry integrated the campus of LTMU. So this is a bit of the background when I try to answer your question. And uh, for young students, the SDGs are visible symbols of what they should consider in their knowledge building on sustainable development. However, I think it's important to single out what is of most important for their own field of studies. Today, all students have examined philosophicum, and in this course, they learn to discuss problems and issues in light of different views of knowledge, science, ethics, and politics. And in here, they should also perhaps reflect more on the sustainable development issues and reflect critically on sustainable development and relate this to their own disciplines. Here also are reflections on ethical challenges related to their own disciplines could come in much stronger, I think. So, uh, and so to the, your second question about uh, mandatory courses in sustainable development. Uh, at uh, NTNU, we do not have specifically mandatory courses besides Exfil for all students, which is similar for all students. Uh, however, uh, we see more often that uh, sustainable development becomes integrated throughout courses where it is relevant. And development becomes integrated throughout the... Um, yes. So, so first, and, um, I would like to turn uh, to you, Examples Catherine. can be in um, studies for the maritime sector, for example. Since you I mentioned that we are on the coast, the uh, our students learn about year. the impact so of fuel report, consumption in vessels and how new technologies can be introduced to reduce this, and this also they how do you think how these enterprises the and, and levels can for help example, Nordic sites speed up the implementation the of the SDGs? And this way, they will learn to reflect the SDGs um, which are uh, relevant. For example, number 14, life under water, and number 13, on climate. And um, this way, they learn how to integrate concern on a natural way into their daily courses. Or and also um, another example for, is, uh, for example, the life cycle thinking. We have the SDG number uh, 12, and they learn how to take responsibility along the production value chain and integrate also systems thinking into uh, their models and in their programs. So this is, uh, of course, of great importance for implementation on um, in their new um, courses and also how to in integrate this into uh, sustainability strategies in firms they will collaborate with. So my conclusion on the questions is that the best effect is to integrate sustainability aspects into the courses and gradually change courses context according to this. However, additional to this, some universities have special programs already and at NTNU we have had uh, special program on industrial ecology already for 20 years and educated uh, a few hundred experts already on how to uh, and they are now sitting in important positions in governmental organization and industry so there are many ways to integrate this so um, yeah i think this is enough for me now
Thank you so much, Anik. I, I also want to clarify that. I, I think it's good that I didn't mean that it has to be done in, in, in one way only, so to speak. And I think it's good that you mentioned that uh, we're relevant. So we should, we should, of course, allow many different models and modes to, to do this in, in some sense. Um, sometimes it might not be relevant for a student that is studying algebra to learn uh, about some of the SDGs or so. We, we need, of course, to do this uh, in a sensible way. Um, thank you so much for this. Um, is there any of you who want to comment on the first round of questions? So I would like to open up for some, some uh, short participatory, <laughs> participatory uh, interactions here. Yes, Catherine. Yeah, I'd like, to I'd like to violently disagree with you on the last uh, comment that you made. Of course, it's okay. for people in, who study algebra to understand <laughs> challenges of the society they're a part of. And the university's greatest responsibility is to make sure that, that its graduates are prepared to be able to contribute to, to the discuss, discussions and, the, and the, the challenges that, that society has. So I, I disagree. I don't think there's ever a situation where it isn't relevant. You might definitely have a point here, Ken. Catherine, of course. Uh, I guess I'm influenced by uh, my own teaching experiences from from uh, a department where I taught about environmental effects of shipping, uh, and some of the students there they were they were simply there to learn how to drive a boat. They were not interested in how some crab uh, feels in the sea or something like that. So, but but for sure, uh, the SDGs concern everybody, of course. Please go ahead. Yeah, just to continue from, from I, I fully agree with Catherine. And uh, one thing that I want to, to, to uh, tell you all is that our university is now starting, um, probably in two years, we're now planning it as one of the first universities in the world to kind of obligatory sustainability science course to all newcomers at uh, the university. It applies to mathem uh, mathematics students and the medicine students and everybody, like IT skills or ethics or whatever you need to, to study that you should go, you will go for one sustainability uh, science course. It's, it will be a huge course because we have 3,000 newcomers every every year, uh, but they are now planning it and, and our university is like very committed to to start it in, in few years. Yeah, I just want to comment this since I brought in the term uh, relevant, uh, because uh, I think many of our students, when they enter university now, they have had a lot about the SDGs from high school, and they are prepared to understand this into, uh, to, they're prepared to learn more about what is the most relevant for their own field of study. So I think we should consider both uh, ways, but uh, to learn how this uh, contribute or impact uh, their own work in the future, I think that's stimulating them to also learn more how it works for other areas as well. So both, maybe. I just want to add that quite often nowadays, the students know much more about sustainable development than the teachers. The teachers have their specialities and their different disciplines, and and uh, sometimes I wonder if the students should maybe uh, maybe should flip classes, classrooms, etc. Uh, but it, it, the challenge is really how to again work across borders between disciplines. How do we how do we make it possible to to bring in aspects that were never in in the courses that are relevant for sustainable development? But in the classical courses that we are giving, how can can new aspects be be included? I think that there are a number of challenges there. I will go ahead and move on from the discussion we had about education uh, to um, to discussion about course mapping. And many universities have mapped and labeled their courses and programs according to the SDGs. So, for example, students would know more what will be taught in, in different courses. And um, the Sustainable Science Center at the University of Copenhagen has, for example, chosen to do this. So, Catherine, could you first summarize, briefly summarize the rationale and the criteria for, for the mapping that you did? 
And yes, secondly, and, and secondly, <laughs> uh, give your view if such mapping and labeling actually improves the quality of the education itself. I would say, first of all, you have to be aware we did this several years ago. And if I was going to do it today, I would do it differently. But the motivation for doing this was the fact that when I went to, as a representing the Sustainability Science Center and talked to institute leaders, they said, oh, but there's lots of sustainability in all of our courses. And when I talked to the students, the students said, but there's no that have anything to do with sustainability. So there seemed to be a there seemed to be um, a, a lack of a, a bridge here between the two. So what we did was we went through all of the course offerings at both bachelor and master's level in all of the faculties and tried to you know, three different people do like it and, and they all tried to see if they could find something in the the pensum and the goals of that course that was relevant for an SDG and then put it in so that you can what happens today is that if the student a potential student goes in and says I want a course that's relevant for SDG 10 then they push a button and they can see all of the courses that are relevant for SDG 10 um, at the university. It was an interesting um, uh, an interesting exercise because of course before we put it on the net we went back to the teachers and said is it okay to plot your course as being relevant to SDG X and many of them said oh but my course has sustainability or what are the SDGs so um, we clearly um, there, there's a there was a mismatch there as well so that's also been very useful I you know in based on my on my previous input today if I was to do it again and I'm, and the person who's going to do this is listening in so I hesitate to come with it but I think we need to revisit this because again I don't think just finding out a course is relevant for a single SDG is particularly interesting. <clears throat> I think what's interesting is how research or courses can contribute to competences that can be used to transform these systems that we talked about earlier. And at this very moment, we're in the process of re um, remapping all of our research at the university so that it's put in the context of can it contribute or how can it contribute to transforming one or more of the of the um, societal uh, activities that requires transformation? I would like to extend that approach or go back and visit courses again once we've got the, the, the research mapped out in this transformation arena. I'd like to go back and try and look at at, um, at education in terms of transformation and not just in the, in, the, um, in the context of SDGs. But given the time that we did this at and the fact that there wasn't that much awareness, at least among the teachers, about SDGs, I think this was a really useful exercise and it doesn't have to be removed yet. I just think it needs to be evolved in the coming time. Thank you, Catherine. So, do you, actually, do you also think that this has, uh, in, in some way, informed the teachers and maybe even put some pressure on the teachers to improve their education about sustainability? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. There's no question about it. And and first of all, they said, "Oh, but you know, we, we know, is this why is it relevant? And could you come and give a guest lecture and help me understand?" And and so yes, oh, absolutely. It's been a way of of getting. Um, the, the, the teachers involved. And the funny thing was that when the, the university itself did a film last year about how wonderful we are to the SD, for the SDGs, and it was the central communication office of the, um, that, that was, that was at the, of the university that was responsible for this. And they did some um, tapes of the rector and we'd supplied the rector with, with um, a, a text of what he should say and where he advertises the fact that we've done this mapping and the head of communication said, oh no, oh no, we haven't, oh, get that out. It's not in them. So yes, we have. So it also um, was very important in terms of, of, of helping the leadership of the university to understand um, just how many links there already are to sustainable sustainability, or at least the SDGs in our, in our existing curriculum. That's great news. Uh, more or less exactly what I, what I 
wanted to hear or sort of anticipated to hear. Um, you didn't uh, give me you, a text. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Catherine. So uh, also in addition to education, uh, of course, universities perform research uh, and they communicate about their research and their SDGs. Um, and hopefully they also work to improve their own operations to align with the SDGs. And Case, uh, you have published an article about realizing the SDGs in the University of Helsinki last autumn. So this was published in Sustainable Development Goals and Institutions of Higher Education. I'm sure we can put a, a link to this um, chapter in, in the chat. But Kaisa, could you briefly describe the conclusions made for your university with regards to this? And do you also think that these conclusions are sort of valid for other Nordic uh, universities, so in other uh, Nordic countries? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, we did the kind of SDG mapping uh, in our university, University of Helsinki, but not the kind of whole research, all the research we have and all the teaching we have, but the kind of new, uh, we mapped the new research and teaching openings in the university uh, that are like a strategic uh, openings uh, uh, starting from 2015. And then we, uh, 2015, 16, 17, 18, and uh, we also mapped the, the university operations and activities from those years. And uh, the results of this mapping uh, showed that, of course, the quality of education, the SDG4, is the goal, goal which was clearly important for all the, the new initiatives, also in, in own operation, which was not, not really surprising. <laughs> and also the SDG17 partnerships and the SDG3 health and well-being were strongly kind of emphasized, emphasizing all the uh, initiatives. But what was interesting, was that the SDG 1, uh, no poverty, SDG 6, clean water and sanitation, SDG 5, gender equality, were not considered uh, almost at all in research activities, not at all, and, and in teaching given very little emphasis. Uh, however, these are like the main major sustainability challenges globally. But uh, we as a country, uh, we compare the report where we, we uh, evaluated the Finnish uh, as a country, the Finland's performance, we are performing very well uh, in, the, in these SDGs, of course. So you can ask that uh, can university, that we are anyway committed to, to, to contribute to global uh, development as a university. So raises the question that we should uh, also think about these SDGs in our strategic planning if we want to have a global impact, uh, uh, even in our co own country, these are uh, already taken care of. Uh, and also one another finding uh, was related a little bit of the, the this, uh, I, I noticed in the program that we will uh, have a presentation on Times Higher Education University Impact Ranking uh, also here in, in this webinar. Uh, and that ranking focuses on 15 SDGs, uh, excluding the SDG 1, the poverty, no poverty, SDG 2, zero hunger, clean air, energy and clean water and sanitation, 15, life on land and SDG 14, life below water. And, and why this exclusion was done was it was decided uh, by the higher education institutions that were, were consulted. But our mapping kind of showed that uh, that also the universities could play a significant role, for example, uh, piloting the new energy solutions like we have uh, solar panels in many of our uh, uh, building roofs at, at the moment and, and so on. So um, it's difficult to say how applicable these results are for, for other universities. I, I guess the quality of education is like obviously core in, in all universities globally. Uh, uh, but I think at least for us, it was quite useful exercise that made us to think that how uh, we should take into account that global aspect uh, more explicitly in, in, in all of our activities. So leaving no one behind is perhaps something to, yes, to exactly. think about yeah. uh, here uh, for, for, uh, for your university. Okay, um, 
although SDSN doesn't accept businesses as members, we are definitely encouraged to develop collaboration and partnerships with businesses. And Anik, I know that you have worked quite a lot with corporates of social responsibility, business models for sustainability and green innovation. Um, how can we as universities and as a network <clears throat> interact more with business without compromising our academic standards of objectivity and transparency and so on. What, what's your view on, on that? Yes, uh, CSR, it's about responsibility. And again, the SDGs put, put attention to areas where this should be practiced. For example, in SDG number 12, responsibility is part of the title of the goal and it's about uh, how companies can show responsibility both upstream and downstream in their production value chains and also how to give uh, information to the consumer uh, about the impact of their products both on the environment and the society. So um, I think it's, uh, it, it's well connected to the SDG, this was just an example. And at uh, NTNU, the, our vision is knowledge for a better world. And we should therefore develop knowledge of importance for all sectors that can contribute to achieve our vision and also the SDGs. And uh, in, uh, by talking about uh, CSR and collaboration with the, with the companies, it's about uh, also how to help uh, business to better see their role to achieve the SDGs in a more holistic system. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in my presentation, it, uh, NTNU campus in Ålesund is uh, one of the most industry integrated campuses. We have double as many from industry at campus as from academia. And it's for all it's natural that all our students also learn how to work with the business. And uh, my experience from, from, from this is quite positive. The students learn from companies and we also learn about what's of important, importance in our courses and training for industry and the development of work, working places for, for the students in the future. But of course, there is sensitive information that companies do not want to share. And this can sometimes be a discussion on how much we could share both ways. But in such cases, we have mechanisms where we can protect the information that students get insight in during their master thesis, for example. And students are also trained in the ethical principles and how to work in collaboration with external partners. So um, as an example, we have a study program in the biomarine innovation. And um, this uh, means that the students need to work very close with industry and with companies. And in fact, we're quite proud of uh, our students here. They have been winning the European Championship and also uh, Norwegian Championships in young entrepreneurship through their student enterprises. So they're trained during their um, study program also to work as business, so to say. So uh, we, uh, I think this is uh, important and uh, close integration between academia and uh, industry is uh, important to develop also understanding of uh, sustainable development in companies. So we have tested this out and we feel very comfortable with working with industry in this way. As you all know, the Nordic countries ranks very well on the SDG index, um, as we also has been described here previously. Um, but we do perform quite poorly on some of the SDGs, for example, 12, 13, 15, 14, and 15. Um, and we also have a very a bad negative spillover score. So negative spillover, spillover effects are, for example, environmental damages in other countries that are connected to our consumption here in our countries. So we have clear problems with this. And Jan, I would firstly like to ask you, um, how can the SDSN Northern Europe members and the SDSN network address negative spillovers? And secondly, what kind of research is needed for societies to have control 
over their negative spillover effects? Is there any uh, quality assurance that science or research can, can contribute with here? Uh, first of all, I think Catherine already mentioned here that uh, we, we need to consider these kinds of aspects. It looks much, we look at the SDG index for, for our Nordic countries, it looks much better than it actually is. Quite often we are consuming, for example, what is produced elsewhere, outside the natural borders, and it looks much better than it actually is. We are globally connected, and that is not really being uh, addressed as much as it should. Um, I think that also we know fairly well how well we do with the SDGs, but it's quite difficult to quantify the effects when it comes to spillover effects. So I think there are a number of scientific questions there, trying to get a be better grasp of understanding of how it works uh, and and how to measure if we, we are going to do anything about it. Uh, and in the end, also, if we look at transformations to try to improve this, it gets quite complicated. And, and yeah, in the end, we need to really think hard about how to balance economic, social, and ecological aspects across national borders. So, so there are a number of interesting research projects that should be carried out in this field. And Justin's last thing what might be that I, I think we need better tools to, to understand and emphasize spillovers like in, in daily life. If you go and shop in, you would like to know to some extent, at least where do the products come from? How, how does it influence the world, not only within our national borders? Um, so not a list of explicit projects for research, but a, a few ideas, Martin. Wonderful. That concludes the third part of the SDSN Northern Europe session. Martin, some concluding remarks from you. Yes, uh, I would just like to thank you so much, Dorothea and Jorge and everybody else who's been involved in this great event. I think we've had a lot of interesting questions and discussions um, behind the screen, so to speak. Um, and I just want to uh, say that we've enjoyed this very much. And uh, please don't hesitate to get in contact with us on our website uh, or on social media or whatever. Um, maybe I can show those addresses on the screen very quickly. Or how are we doing on time, Dorothea? Are we? We are perfectly on time for our next session to start. So I would invite you to paste this um, in the comment section but not yes. sure you We will Wonderful. do that. Thank you so much, everybody, again for this. Uh, and have a lovely afternoon or morning or evening or wherever you are. That's for sure. Um, our attendees are all around the world at this stage. So uh, thank you, everyone uh, from the SDSN Northern Europe uh, for joining today. Um, this concludes our session on sustainable development from the Nordic perspective. And I um, we're all leaving this with lots of food for thought. And I just ask everybody to mute their microphones, I'm getting a lot of feedback noise. Um, yeah, just saying thank you to our colleagues from Sweden on leaving us with uh, so much to think about in terms of the Nordic perspective on sustainable development.